So here I have two devices, and I will transfer one dollar from this device to this device instantaneously. Enter the amount, and send. I'm seeing the transaction now. And there it is. What you've just witnessed is what looks like a standard financial transaction. Money was transferred electronically from one account to another. But while it appears like an ordinary bank transfer, it may perhaps be the most revolutionary technology you're likely to see in your lifetime. This technology is called Bitcoin. Money makes possible the exchange of many different goods and services among many different people. Wherever we go, we see money being used as a medium of exchange. Money is at the core of our existence. Every day, we transact with one another. Currently, almost all of our daily transactions involve a third party, a bank, credit card company, or remittance provider. And ultimately, it's these institutions that carry out the transaction on our behalf. This is until the invention of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is truly one of the most important inventions ever in the history of humankind. That's how big of an impact it's going to have on our lives. And it sounds really difficult and complicated and hard to understand hearing about it. If you had only heard about email, it would sound difficult and complicated and hard to use. Bitcoin is literally easier to use than email. So what exactly is Bitcoin? Well, for starters, Bitcoin isn't actually a coin. Bitcoin is a new form of money, a currency that lives solely on the internet, one that some have even called magic internet money. I think part of the confusion is that Bitcoin is actually two different things. It's both a currency and a payment network. And we've never had one thing that's both of those at the same time. So the dollar is a currency, but it's not a payment network. PayPal and Visa are payment networks, but they're not currencies. Bitcoin is both of those things at the same time, but it has this other property. And that other property is that it can instantly be teleported anywhere in the world just like that almost for free, and there's nothing that anybody can do to block these teleportations. There's nothing anybody can do to intercept these teleportations. And if you're careful about how you use Bitcoin, you can do these teleportations anonymously. So with Bitcoin, with a push of a button, you can pay anyone anywhere in the world or receive payment from anyone anywhere in the world. In the aftermath of the global financial crisis, an author using the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto posted a nine-page document onto an online forum. The document, titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, would soon become the building block for what is today the first fully working concept of decentralized money. These are the daily candles of Bitcoin, just in the backdrop. But I want to talk about these uh, trend lines. You've seen them on other presentations even earlier today. I started out working at Bear Stearns back in 2007, so about a year and a half or so before the financial crisis really started to hit. And after Bear Stearns, I joined JP Morgan, where I became a VP, and that was my last job. All of these jobs were either midtown or downtown Manhattan. Tone Vase is a Wall Street veteran. A former VP at JP Morgan, he now spends his time studying and educating audiences about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is generally difficult to explain. Uh, you want to try and break it down as simple as you can. So the simplest way is, is basically it's, a, it's like a message. It's a digital message that you're passing. And normally we're all used to computers. We're all sending emails. We're all sending pictures. But you're always sending a copy. Anytime you hit the send button in a computer, 
you always retain a copy, you always retain the original. And when it comes to financial transactions, you hit the send button and you have an intermediary, the bank, that is moving money from one account to another. And this is the problem that Bitcoin solved. It was able to take something digital and when you hit the send button, you're not actually sending a copy. You're actually sending um, a digital object. At its core, Bitcoin is basically a new monetary system. However, Bitcoin is unlike any other system we've seen in the past because it isn't centralized in one place. This decentralized nature of the Bitcoin platform is one of the things that make it so unique and world-changing. We're all familiar with PayPal or Visa or Bank of whatever. All of these traditional services that we're used to control who's allowed to have an account, who can send money from who, from what country's users can send money to other country's users. With Bitcoin, there is no entity that's controlling any of that. There's just this software protocol that anyone can write software to interact with, and then anyone can install that software on their phone or on their computer. And once they have the software installed, they can now interact with anyone else anywhere in the entire world that's also using the Bitcoin software. This software that runs the Bitcoin protocol is commonly called a wallet, a digital purse which stores and allows the holder to move Bitcoins from one wallet to another. The Bitcoin protocol is open source, meaning that the programming code is freely available to add to and redistribute. In this way, similar to anyone being able to add a new website to the World Wide Web, programmers are able to add new products to the Bitcoin network. Uh, we have Jason, for whom this is very late evening because he is in Australia, uh, and we're about to do Jason's first Bitcoin transaction over Skype as our medium, so everyone can see how quick and easy it is. Uh, on my end, I will hit uh, send, and uh, Jason is going to hit request. So when he hits request, a QR code should have displayed in the middle of your screen. And he's going to put it up to the camera of Skype so I can scan it with the camera in my cell phone. All right, I see the QR code. My phone is trying to scan it. And there it is. I scanned it. So I feel kind of generous. Let's send Jason $5. So I have just sent Jason $5 in Bitcoin. Uh, and let me know when it's registering on your end that you have $5 worth of Bitcoin. And there it is. Okay, so that took about 10 to 15 seconds. Bitcoin enables users to send and receive money instantly without the involvement of a third party. This digital breakthrough allows the user to effectively become their own bank. This is a complex idea to handle, but the possibilities of this new bankless currency are enormous. Yes, With the exception of actually handing physical cash to you, generally we have to rely on third parties for lots of different payments, be it credit cards or wire transfers internationally, or even sort of keeping cash under your bed, storing large amounts of cash, we use banks. And what Bitcoin does is allow us to do all of those things without any third parties. So in that sense, we can be our own bank, we can be our own payment system, we can be our own international wire system, we can be our own remittance system, we can do all of these things without relying on any other third parties. That's what Bitcoin allows us to do. Before Bitcoin, all these companies like PayPal and Visa and Bank of America and you know, any business, they had a ledger that kept track of all their account balances. So PayPal has a ledger that keeps track of exactly who has how much money in each PayPal account. And that ledger is stored on PayPal servers in PayPal's data center somewhere. And before the invention of Bitcoin, people thought that it was impossible. All the mathematicians and computer scientists thought that it was impossible to have consensus on a distributed ledger like this. But what Bitcoin did, is it came along and figured out how to keep track of this ledger that keeps track of who has what Bitcoin. But instead of that ledger being on one data center, it's on 
everybody's computer across the entire planet that's running the Bitcoin network, including my laptop right here. I have a full copy of the entire Bitcoin uh, ledger. This public ledger, known as the blockchain, is perhaps what could make Bitcoin a financial game changer. Bitcoin is what is known as a cryptocurrency, meaning that it's a digital currency in which encryption is used to regulate the creation of new units and verify the transfer of funds. New Bitcoins come into existence through a process called mining. A miner is a person or entity who runs a very powerful computer in an effort to solve a complex mathematical puzzle known as a block. Miners around the world compete to solve or close a block and are rewarded with newly generated Bitcoins if they're successful. All transactions that travel through the Bitcoin network are pieces of this complex mathematical puzzle. So when a miner solves a puzzle, they're actually verifying the integrity of each and every transaction. Welcome. <laughs> this is one giant abandoned recycling plant. We've got incinerators over there, those two big silos. Right around this wall, we have a megawatt worth of solar panels. It's a lot. Um, that's about as much as what we consume. So we're going to be able to offset our electrical costs completely. So this is a work in progress, but a Bitcoin mine is a group of computers that contribute its processing power to facilitating Bitcoin transfers and the security of the network. Yeah, it is one big supercomputer, and all of these individual computers are kind of throwing guesses at this mathematical problem. And it's a, it's a very difficult problem. It takes lots and lots of computers to guess it. Uh, once that guess is correct, that is sent to all the rest of the computers, and with that answer, they record all the transactions that have been done up to that point. It's a very secure system for uh, facilitating transfers, recording transfers, and making sure that no kind of shady work has been done. Because there's, there's some methods in, in financial transactions where you could double spend, and this whole blockchain thing is, is one great method of make sure that doesn't happen. Say if Alice wants to send Bob an email, uh, what would happen under the, the hood is that along the path of the email across the network, um, her email gets copied in many places of the network. And eventually, the final copy will be relayed to, to Bob. That's how email works. That's how digital transfers work. And that's how it should work for, for the majority of digital transfers. That's, that's well and good. However, in the case of money, that would be disastrous if, if that were to be the way that money was transferred digitally. Um, you don't want copies of the same dollar bill to, be, to exist on the network. That, that, that would ruin the scarcity uh, uh, premise of, of, of money. And so this was the problem that Satoshi Nakamoto um, tackled with the, the creation of Bitcoin. Um, and so what happens with Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin's blockchain, is that when Alice wants to send one Bitcoin to Bob, she creates a transaction, and that transaction gets copied across the entire network. However, this is different than, say, a single email, because that transaction has embedded in it instructions to the rest of the network that says, from here on out, control over this Bitcoin is now conferred to Bob. Okay? And the rest of the network honors that. One time, I, I realized that, wow, Bitcoin is really difficult for people to understand, as I spent the whole evening explaining Bitcoin to a friend of mine. And then uh, I got home that night, and uh, she posted on my Facebook page. And she goes, yeah, I was thinking more about Bitcoins. and." You were explaining Bitcoin mining, and does that mean that Bitcoins are originally underground? And I realized that Bitcoin's a difficult concept for, for people to understand, and especially Bitcoin mining as well, because Bitcoins are not originally underground. For new users, Bitcoin can be a difficult concept to understand. Bitcoins aren't physical, and they certainly aren't underground. However, there are some interesting similarities between Bitcoin and a precious metal that is found underground. Gold.
Gold has been money and a store of value for thousands of years. Today, gold is mined all over the world. The amount of gold that can be extracted from the ground decreases over the life of a mine until eventually the mine is exhausted of all of its gold. Bitcoins are also mined in a similar fashion. The Bitcoin algorithm is programmed so that the reward for mining new Bitcoins is halved every four years until the year 2140, when all Bitcoins will have been deemed to have been mined. Perhaps the mysterious creator behind Bitcoin was trying to mimic the attributes of gold, almost as if to create a digital gold coin which could be divided and then sent instantly around the world. I try to explain it in some really simple way, like uh, miners, Bitcoin mining miners, they receive the reward just because they maintain the security of Bitcoin. Mathematically, it means that uh, you need to solve quite difficult problems. It's a just guessing process. You have to make millions and millions and millions of guesses. And if you are right and you are able to close all these transactions inside of one block, you are successful and you receive 12.5 bitcoins as miner. Originally, this reward was 50 bitcoins. Every four years, uh, uh, these uh, this reward for miners uh, is two times um, less, so reward will be decreasing over the time. The creator of Bitcoin, whoever he is, was a really, really, really smart guy. And uh, he obviously liked math a lot. And he sat down and did some calculations and thought to himself, if everybody in the entire world were to start using Bitcoin, how many Bitcoins will we need in order for that to be able to accommodate everybody using Bitcoin for this? And uh, each Bitcoin can be divided down to a hundred millionth of a Bitcoin. And if everybody in the entire world were to start using Bitcoin as their money, the smallest unit of a Bitcoin, which is called a Satoshi, it's one hundred millionth of a Bitcoin, would still be worth less than one US penny if the entire world were to start using Bitcoin. So who is this Satoshi Nakamoto? Two years after publishing the white paper for the peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, this mysterious figure vanished, never to be heard from again. The only clues to his or her identity can be found in the white paper. Some speculate he or she is of British origin due to the writings containing some British slang. Others believe that rather than being one person, Satoshi was a group of hackers working in concert to create a new monetary system which would decentralize money as we know it. I think he was a clever guy. He was not a normal geek. He had good knowledge of uh, decentralized technology or uh, decentralization. He had good knowledge of financial system. And he was quite good coder. But the code of Bitcoin is not definitely the best one. So it's definitely possible to, to write better code. There is also conspiration theory if Bitcoin code uh, was written by one guy or many different guys, hard to say. Anyway, I especially appreci appreciate that it's first fully working concept of decentralized money. It's very interesting like who Satoshi is, uh, there's lots of speculation, especially among like the very early people in Bitcoin. Uh, but what difference does it make whether we know who created Bitcoin? Uh, I, don't, I don't know that it makes any difference. There's lots of stuff that we use that we don't know who created it. Uh, and yet it gives us a lot of advantages in our day-to-day -day activities. I have no idea who Satoshi is. Um, we know very little about Satoshi. And so he could be at an event, um, he could be someone we know, he could be someone I've spoken to, he could be a friend of mine for all I know. I don't know who it is, I don't know if we'll ever know, but it's, it's a fun game. Am I Satoshi? Uh, I don't think I'll answer that one. Regardless of the true identity of Satoshi, what he or she has invented could have profound effects on how our world evolves into the future.
、うん、ビットコインで支払うとなんかかっこいいな、うん、そんな感じです最新最先端を言ってるっていう感じ Because Bitcoin enables the user to act as their own bank, in essence, it frees the user from the traditional gatekeepers to their wealth. Bitcoin is a credit card to the credit card. It's 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 a credit card. We all use keys in our daily lives. Keys allow us to access and control our valued possessions. They also protect our valuables from being stolen. Take your car as an example. Holding the keys to your car allows you access to it whenever you wish. But suppose you've had a few too many to drink and your loyal friend confiscates your keys from you. The car may still be yours, but now you no longer control it. Taxi. And must hail a ride home. The same can be said of our finances. Although you may have the debit card and password to your bank account, the funds aren't directly in your possession. Every time you make a withdrawal or transfer from your bank account, the bank is actually acting on your behalf and moving the funds for you. This is where Bitcoin is fundamentally different. Bitcoin. Enables an individual to hold the private keys of their own wealth. So, with pretty much every asset that we have out there,、uh, we don't directly hold the dominion or control over that asset.、Uh, for example, the Royal Bank of Scotland, they had 700,000 accounts, ATMs, just went down for the weekend. Nobody could access the ATMs, couldn't get money out. Uh, you have a credit card or a debit card, and it gets turned off because of suspected fraud, or you did a charge in an unusual location. Well, guess what? The credit card company holds those private keys. They get to make the choice, not you. Bitcoin is very, very different in this regard. It is built on public private key encryption. And what that means is that you send Bitcoins to the public key. And then, in order to send the bitcoins, you have to be able to sign with the private key where the bitcoins、uh, currently reside. And that literally is a, a number. That private key is a number. Bitcoin, nobody gets to turn it off. If you have the private key, you get to access it and use it. With your Bitcoin wallets, there's associated、um, what are called private keys.、Okay? And these are literally what they sound like they're private. Keys that can open and unlock your access to your funds. But let's be clear if you lose any of your private keys, you lose access to your funds. Simple as that. So, we just bought some bitcoins out of a local Bitcoin ATM. And so, what actually comes out is、uh, what we call a cold wallet. It's a little piece of paper with two squares on it, or two things that look like Roche ink blotch tests, and a bunch of alphanumerics underneath each. Now, the top is the public key, which is what people would use to send bitcoins to this address. And the bottom one is the private key,、um, which is what you would use to scan in order to retrieve bitcoins from this address. Now, it's very important to note that that private key is something that you really shouldn't be showing around everywhere because whoever scans this first will be able to take the bitcoins off this address. Also, if you were to happen to lose this piece of paper, then you've actually essentially lost your bitcoins because nobody else has a copy of this private key. Right now, there actually is some bitcoins on this address. So, if you're seeing this for the first time, you may be able to scan this off yourself and take the bitcoins for yourself. So, here is a Satori coin.、Uh, there is a value of 0.001 bitcoin inside. Uh, in today's、um, exchange rate,、uh, that would mean about、uh, 45 cents. So it's a very minimal、uh, amount, but it is true Bitcoin inside. 
Now, how to redeem the value out of this token, one would have to peel off the hologram sticker in the back. There we go. And then a QR code would be exposed. And this QR code is the private key information, which is essentially like a password. And with this private key, and only with this private key, one can redeem, you can import that value to your Bitcoin wallet. Anything that's physical has a very strong sense of authority or authenticity. And to make the barrier to entry to Bitcoin as low as possible, um, I think everyone working on the project felt it was really important that someone could have a part of Bitcoin that they can hold in their hands that's portable and uh, doesn't cost very much to get started. It's kind of a low commitment object. Because Bitcoin is built on public, private key encryption, the entire workflow for sending payments, particularly online, is fundamentally different from that of credit cards. Credit cards were never built to be used on the internet in the first place. When the credit cards were made, uh, there was no internet. So a pull system is that you've given the authorization to the merchant or the credit card issue to, to pull from your bank account uh, whenever it is that they feel that they have the right to do so. With a credit card, whenever you want to initiate a transaction, you are effectively giving the keys to the merchant, right? And you give your keys to every merchant you, you deal with. Um, so every time you, you make a transaction, for example, online or so, you're taking a risk because you're entrusting the merchant with these, this very personal information, which they could then take to initiate transactions as well if they wanted to. Whereas Bitcoin, it's a, it's a completely different model where the control uh, is more weighted towards the, the consumer. The consumer then pushes their, their funds to you. Um, and then, um, if you're doing an internet service, right, you could broadcast a Bitcoin address and anyone in the world could send Bitcoin to you. If you were a, a band, a musical band, and you're, you're performing on a concert and your concert was being broadcast uh, you know, around the world, if you put up on the stage a, a, you know, uh, a sign that had a Bitcoin address, well, you could be funded by anyone who was watching that broadcast anytime they watched it uh, from that point onward. My name is Sanshiro Fujimoto, and I play the saxophone and the other instruments. I compose and perform and make CDs, and I make my living by being a musician. Today's small live show I did uh, without no uh, admission fee. And if you appreciate my music, then you can tip me. By tipping, you don't know how much. You might get zero, or if your performance is great, you might get more than you think. So that makes me play better. Direct uh, interaction is more, more about the art itself. And uh, if you tip uh, someone in the street, you don't tip big money, you tip like 10 cents, quarters, and small money. But uh, to send the small money on the internet costs more than what you're supposed to tip. So Bitcoin is much better way to tip someone in the internet. Bitcoin payments are a push system, meaning that the funds are pushed from sender to receiver. This makes for a faster and cheaper system than traditional pool systems like credit card transactions. This in turn also means that Bitcoin transactions are final and cannot be reversed. Credit cards actually has about a six month settlement time. Even though the transaction looks like it went through, the person can then call back and say this was a fraudulent transaction. 
and then the credit card will take that money away from the merchant in some cases. In some cases, the credit card will eat the cost, and that's a chargeback. Now, we pay for this. This is the 3% fee. Merchants usually pay this 3% in order to accept credit cards. So Bitcoin transactions don't have chargebacks. I think of it as a good thing. Um, as much as people like to say how, um, how great it is to dispute things, it very, very rarely happens. Almost never do you order something from a legitimate company and you were not satisfied and then the company did not solve your problem. Most of the time this situation happens is when your credit card is actually stolen. And your credit card is, can always be stolen. Everyone's credit card is all over the internet. It's just luck or bad luck if your credit card happens to be used in a fraudulent transaction. We have some businesses accepting Bitcoin, mostly restaurants, for example. We have some restaurants here set up in Acapulco. For merchants, when they accept Bitcoin, it's for them to have another option, an innovative option. And for them, they have, they have a lot of advantages. We don't charge what the credit card fees charge every time they slide the, the, the card. Three, four, five, even 10%, depending on the credit card. We don't charge anything. We don't have a minimum fee. You can pay uh, 10 pesos, 50 pesos. We don't have a minimum. With Bitcoin payments lowering the cost of doing business and eliminating the possibility of fraudulent transactions, companies ranging from mom and pop stores to multinational corporations have started to embrace this new way to transfer value. This is Harvard Medical School, and this is Harvard Chair. I visited here with 1997 to 1999.僕らは今ファックスを使ってますけれども、今フェイスブックとか、SNSでもすぐ写真でね、旅行行く時もパスポートもファックスを取らずに送ることができます。ということはファックスはもう未来ないと。そしたらクレジットカードとか、それからお金
um, have the equivalent of a bank in their cell phone. According to the latest World Bank figures, there are approximately 2 billion unbanked people throughout the developing world. The adoption and use of Bitcoin in these countries could transform this human rights issue and allow the unbanked population of the world to participate in the global economy. For the first time in the entire history of the world, anyone can now send or receive any amount of money with anyone else anywhere instantly, basically for free, and it's impossible for anyone, including governments, to stop them from doing that. And as much as I love gold, gold, gold can't do that. Right? Think about that. Here, anybody in this room, you can now send and receive any amount of money with anyone anywhere in the world right now, and there's nothing that anybody can do to stop that. That was not possible before the invention of Bitcoin, and that is a fundamentally world-changing technology for every single human being on the planet. WikiLeaks uh, was able to find funding through Bitcoin. And this was in the midst of a financial blockade that WikiLeaks was facing. At the time, uh, the U.S. had uh, ordered the uh, Visa, I think it was MasterCard as well, Bank of America, uh, to blockade any donations to WikiLeaks. Say what you will about Wiki, you know, uh, WikiLeaks. Uh, not necessarily that I condone everything that they do, but I do think it is very important um, for freedom in the world, for people to have uh, uncensorable uh, ability to, to donate money to whatever political causes that they want to. And so I thought that that was extremely powerful for uh, WikiLeaks to be able to def defy the U.S. in that sense. Because Bitcoin puts the private keys of wealth in the hands of the user, it can be used to support activist causes. But Bitcoin can also be used for a night out on the town. My name is Ken Shishido. I am co-organizer for Tokyo Bitcoin Meetup Group. We have this uh, special event tonight, having uh, burlesque dancers receiving Bitcoin tips. The reason why I do this is that sometimes we want to um, make our meetup interesting instead of you know talking about really really technical stuff or political stuff so this is one of the events we want to make it really fun and see what can be done using bitcoin currently if you're living in in most countries buying things is not a problem you have credit cards you can still use cash and to me that is not the true use of Bitcoin. The true use of Bitcoin is to give you financial privacy, which I find extremely important. During the global financial crisis, as cracks in the financial system spread, institutions once thought to be invincible were shown to be vulnerable. As we now know, governments around the world were forced to bail out financial institutions. A bailout is when government takes taxpayer money and gives it to an irresponsible financial institution to bail out their mistakes. A bail-in is different in that laws are written which permit financial institutions to take funds directly from customer accounts to shore up their losses. Such a thing occurred in Cyprus in 2013. When I started learning about Bitcoin back in 2013, especially during the Cyprus event, when banks were shut down and money was confiscated from people, I remember telling my coworkers, some of the PhDs, the quants, this is really bad. This is actually gonna probably start happening in many other Western countries. And they were all laughing at me saying, no, it's just Cyprus, it'll never happen here. And that's when I knew someone must have come up with a way to get around this problem. When a depositor deposits dollars or euros into the bank, title to the dollars or euros transfers to the bank, and those depositors become unsecured creditors of the bank. If the banks screw up for whatever reason, uh, there's now been legislation passed in many of the countries where they can be bailed in, meaning that their deposits can be turned into shares of the bank. 
Jeff Berwick is an entrepreneur, financial commentator, and podcast host. Having founded Stockhouse.com, Canada's largest financial news website, Jeff's analysis, writings, and videos have been viewed by millions of people around the world. It's difficult to say exactly what's going to happen in the future, but it's definitely going to keep happening. I said after Cyprus is going to happen in Greece, and then they shut down the banks in Greece for months. Uh, and of interest to people who live in Europe is, on January 1st of this year, they passed a European bank bail-in legislation. Uh, so that, that should be a huge wake-up call to people that they're doing that. So in Cyprus, they didn't actually pass it before. So in Cyprus, they closed the banks, then they came up with some legislation and said the banks could just take their customers' money to keep afloat. Uh, so they didn't even have that legislation, and they did that in Cyprus. Now they already have it in place, so they know what's coming. I see Bitcoin as a way to protect and hide your assets. And we're not saying this is bad. I'm not saying that only criminals hide their assets, no. Uh, people that have worked hard, and they've paid taxes, and they've done everything, and like what happened in Greece and Cyprus, where money in bank accounts was just confiscated. So if the next time the banking system gets in trouble, um, it could be users' accounts that are raided to help fund the banking system. We're talking people with significant money, 100,000, 200,000, but it's legal money. They've worked hard for it. Some economists believe that the global financial crisis of the last decade was just a precursor to a much larger calamity. If this is the case, how will governments react in response to the next failure of our financial system? Unlike the current banking system, Bitcoin allows individuals to hold the private keys to their wealth. However, this also comes with the added responsibility of securing the Bitcoins. With Bitcoin, you're in 100% complete control of your own money, but that also means you're 100% responsible for what happens to your own money. So it's your job to make sure that you keep your Bitcoin safe. People are used to things like credit cards and bank accounts and PayPal, and if your credit card gets stolen, you just call the credit card company and they cancel it and that's the end of it. If your Bitcoins get stolen, there's nobody that you can call to ask to for uh, ask for help. But uh, the other side of the coin there is that there's nobody that you have to call to ask for, for permission to use your Bitcoins however you want. So it cuts both ways. Mt. Gox, the Tokyo-based Bitcoin exchange, has filed for bankruptcy protection. The announcement comes days after the exchange announced that as much as $450 million of the virtual currency had gone missing. CEO Mark Capelli's apologized and bowed deeply on Japanese television. It remains unclear if the missing bitcoins were stolen, voided by technological flaws, or both. So actually, this is the, the old Mt. Gox building. Mt. Gox was the biggest Bitcoin exchange that ever existed. I think at some point they were doing over like $100 million a day worth of volume. And um, they collapsed in a, quite a spectacular fashion in 2014. I think the size of the losses uh, amounted to over $450 million. They claimed to have lost 850,000 Bitcoins, of which 200,000 were found afterwards in some old wallet. People were putting money in and essentially giving them their bitcoins, giving them the control of the private keys. And, and the irony is that exact centralization risk is what bitcoin is supposed to free us from. And Mt. Gox just took all of the decentralized nature of bitcoin and put it into one company with a lot of people's money. And then on top of that, put the control of that company's finances under one person who has the keys to the kingdom. So we've probably seen over the last two or three years, I would, by my count, probably somewhere between half a dozen um, to upwards of 10 different uh, major hacks of companies that, that are involved in Bitcoin. Uh, and one thing you have to understand is that Bitcoin is fundamentally different from uh, securing an asset that's, uh, you know, that's held within the, the regular financial space. Uh, with Bitcoin, if you ever get access to the, the private key uh, to someone's wallet, you can initiate a transaction outside of the infrastructure of that company uh, without their knowledge. Um, that's unlike anything that exists currently in the financial space, uh, where if you want to take money out of the, 
uh, you know, that target, uh, you have to have infiltrated their, their infrastructure. I think it's part of the mentality where people are trained not to trust themselves with their own money. And so everybody puts their money in a bank for safekeeping. And so that, that sort of mentality where you put your money in, in some pooled company whose sole purpose is to safeguard it, that is a really hard stigma to break, to change. Um, and I think this is the thing that's the most challenging about Bitcoin is that it challenges people to question that stigma. Um, it challenges people to take control of your own money and value and to safeguard it yourself. As we know, at this time, Bitcoin is quite secure. If you have more than uh, half of Bitcoin network power, you can take a control of the Bitcoin network. But technically, this is really hard. When we consider the current Bitcoin uh, power, it's almost impossible. So from this point of view, Bitcoin is uh, much secure than the, the, the biggest and the most secure portals of some biggest banks in the world. The problem is that many people do not trust Bitcoin just uh, because there, there were a lot of news about hacking some Bitcoin portals and some exchange uh, services and so on. The problem is that uh, like all services uh, based on Bitcoins is not a Bitcoin, you know, itself. So you, can, you cannot uh, associate or, or you cannot associate the uh, security of Bitcoin-based services with the, the, the Bitcoin itself. The collapse of the Mt. Gox Bitcoin exchange in 2014 caused much confusion and skepticism about the security of Bitcoin. However, years after the collapse of the once largest Bitcoin exchange, Bitcoin is now on the radar of many institutions within the financial industry. The big question, the, the conversation you, you would you would hear is that uh, the question was whether uh, blockchain technology would impact the financial industry. Okay. Uh, and now, if you go to the trade shows and you listen to uh, the media, the question is not whether, the question is how blockchain technology will, will impact and transform the financial industry. It's now a foregone conclusion that blockchain technology will impact the financial industry in a major way. So, so that's where we are now. But we weren't always there. Uh, if you look just three years ago, two years ago, um, the attitude was that Bitcoin was um, almost a laughable concept and it was a non-sustainable non uh, system and it couldn't be applied in the financial space. In Japan, the virtual currency law has passed in the lower house uh, and hopefully actually it will pass in the upper house as well in the very near future. That means actually government recognizes the, the existence of the virtual currency and then trying to actually set some regulations um, and trying to actually support the business. Uh, this Bitcoin, why well, it looks uh, great, you know. It's a nice piece of collection, you know better than a yen or a penny. Some of the areas where Bitcoin has been most popular so far is China, which has quite a high level of capital controls. Other countries like China, Argentina, Iran, uh, this is where Bitcoin's really caught on to a lot of people because you just simply, it's not easy to transfer money in or out of the country without going through regulatory problems or having to know someone in the government and things like that. So. Definitely that is a huge uh, boost to Bitcoin. The advantages of Bitcoin continue to increase its popularity around the world, sometimes in the most unlikely of places. My name is David Hyatt and I operate the Phoenix Rising Cafe in Nimbin. This is where our Bitcoin machine is uh, located, right next to the traditional ATM machine. Um, so the customers have a choice of uh, using either. I saw that the current banking system was rather restrictive and the independence of people running their own banking systems really appealed to me. And the fact also that it was digital 
and we're living in a digital age, I just knew that it was something that would have to get traction over time. Bitcoin is definitely the largest innovation in monetary science since Isaac Newton's gold standard. It's going to completely revolutionize how all of our assets are held, so it's going to disrupt law, it's going to disrupt accounting, it's going to disrupt our finance industry, it's going to disrupt so much. It will also rapidly decentralize the capital. No longer will millions of people accumulate all of their capital into one big pile that then gets allocated by a senior vice president of Merrill Lynch or Bank of America. Uh, it'll be millions of people that you have to go and entice uh, out of their capital to go fight a war in Afghanistan or Iraq. Once you decentralize all of those private keys, it becomes much more difficult to get people to pay for a lot of these goods and services that they otherwise wouldn't necessarily pay for. I'll just scan it, and now I have your Bitcoin address in my wallet right here, and I'll go ahead and enter $1, and we'll hit send. Mine's sending the transaction. Sent, and if you, t there you go, you heard the noise. Before Bitcoin, I was basically retired. I was just hanging out, enjoying my life, practicing jujitsu every day, and it was really fun, but wasn't really gonna make the world that much of a better place, if at all. Um, and then I discovered Bitcoin, and I looked around the world, and I saw all these wars being fought, and central banks debasing the currency, and it basically preventing the world from being as good of a place as it potentially could be. And I saw Bitcoin, and I saw this as a tool to strip away all of their power to do that. Most people aren't interested in paying to kill people they've never met in other countries. Um, most people are willing to pay for roads and schools and hospitals. So if the government say we need money for roads and schools and hospitals, I think people would probably give them a, a good chunk of that. If governments say we need money to go kill people in other countries that you've never been to in your entire life and you're probably never going to go to in your entire life, people are going to say, no, I don't want to pay for that. But with, if you're using bank accounts and dollars and euros, governments can seize all the money out of your bank account at any time. They can print as many new dollars or euros as they want to pay for these things at any time. If the world's using Bitcoin, it takes away those tools from government, and I think that makes the world a much, much better place. For the first time in history, Bitcoin now provides the entire world with a completely decentralized payment system, one where each individual holds the ownership and control of their own financial wealth, one where all users can transfer value and interact freely amongst each other instantly. What could the future of our world look like with such a revolutionary tool? The possibilities could be truly magical. Bitcoin is magic internet money. Uh, Bitcoin allows you to send and receive money with anyone anywhere in the world, just like magic. There's, I'm, all, I'm, I'm at a loss for words because it's that exciting and that world changing. With Bitcoin, you can pull out your iPod or your iPhone or your tablet or whatever, install an app, and in less than 30 seconds, you have the ability to send and receive money with anyone anywhere in the world, basically for free. And you can be 10 years old and do that, or you can be 100 years old and do that, and you can be that in any country. That's magic.